Good afternoon. I'm Jefferson Parker, psychologist in the Department of Psychiatry and Human Behavior. And I'm going to be going through module number one of disparities in mental health care and the effect on patients. This is one of three modules. The second will be presented by Dr. Sabrina De Leon, who's a psychiatry resident in our department, and the third by Shirley Pendolfi who is in UMC's Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. We've been working on these modules together, and uh, hopefully they will present uh, an integra integrated series for you as we go through. So here are the objectives for this module number one, just two. Um, I wanted to describe what we know about existing disparities in mental health care and also the effects of those disparities on patients. So first, let's talk about cultural differences. For one thing, cultures, different cultures, differ in how they describe symptoms or how they present the symptoms or how they express symptoms. So what you hear from a patient may be different from patient to patient, even if the underlying condition is the same. Different cultures also do not have the same understanding necessarily about the causes of the symptoms that they have. So it's important to consider that as well. And thirdly, different cultures attach different meaning. They may attach no meaning at all, but some cultures may attach meaning, certain meaning, to certain symptoms. For example, certain symptoms may be uh, considered to have a spiritual relevance or due to a different kind of illness than we might consider in uh, mainstream culture. So these differences can create problems for us. The, the DSM-5, current version of the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, it's a culturally created, it's, there's no escape from culture. So, so the, the symptoms that are outlined in each, for each of the diagnoses have a cultural element to them. Furthermore, as providers, we have no choice or no option but, but to approach patients and also the DSM-5 from our own individual cultural perspective. We can't escape from that. And then thirdly, when we're thinking about developing a plan of care or a treatment plan for a patient, it's important that we arrive at a shared understanding of the problem. If there's not a shared understanding of the problem, it makes it much less likely that the plan of treatment will be truly collaborative or that it will be followed to the extent necessary to result in cons uh, successful So let's talk a little bit about prevalence. So the National Institutes of Mental Health um, has a, uh, an entity called the Consortium on Psychiatric Epidemiology Studies. They've done a series of studies over the years looking at the epidemiology of psychiatric conditions. So using Caucasians or whites as a reference group, they have found uh, a few different things here, which are outlined on this slide. Number one, um, Minorities have a lower lifetime and past year prevalence of mental health disorders. However, they have more mental health symptoms. So these are sub-diagnostic symptoms. That's the distinction between mental health disorder and mental health symptoms, sub-diagnostic symptoms. And for those minorities who do meet diagnostic criteria, their illness tends to be more severe than in Caucasian. So there's some exceptions. Number one, Native Americans are an exception, especially um, with regard to PTSD. They are a higher risk of PTSD than Caucasians. And African Americans or blacks have a much higher rate of schizophrenia. They're overrepresented in state psychiatric facilities with schizophrenic diagnosis. There is uh, robust now evidence, because this has been looked at um, 
for many years by many different people, but there's ro robust evidence that clinicians over-diagnose, in other words, they erroneously diagnose schizophrenia in blacks. Um, there is some evidence that the differences are too large. The difference between blacks and non-blacks are too large to be accounted for by errors alone. So, so the fact that there there is overdiagnosis does not necessarily mean, and appears that it does not mean, that that, that there is not also some um, higher risk of schizophrenia in African Americans than in non-African Americans. Here are a few definitions. So what do we mean by disparity? So disparity, as you see here, is the state in which there's a gap between health equity and reality. In other words, we have not achieved health equity. So uh, well, lack of health equity means there's a disparity. What is health equity? Well, health equity is the state when everyone has the opportunity to attain their full health potential and that no one who has achieved their potential is done so um, simply or purely by uh, socially determined circumstances or advantages. This is a really important statement. I try to refrain from reading slides, but I'm going to make an exception here and just read this to you, even though you're certainly can read it yourself. This is from the Institute of Medicine. This has been a very influential statement, and it says this. Racial and ethnic minorities tend to receive a lower quality of health care than non-minorities, even when access-related factors like patients' insurance status and income are controlled. The sources of these disparities are complex and are rooted in historic and contemporary inequities and involve many participants at several levels, including health systems, their administrative and bureaucratic processes, utilization managers, healthcare professionals, and patients. That's from the Institute. So what I'm going to do now is provide several different examples of um, well-documented disparities in, mental, in the mental health arena. So starting with this one, death by suicide. And this look is for Mississippi specifically. These are the latest data from the Mississippi Department of Health. So in 2019, in Mississippi, uh, suicide was the 12th leading cause of death. It's the only listed cause of death due to a mental health condition. So look at, the, at these rates. These are rates per 100,000 citizens of Mississippi. More than three times higher rate of mortality, or chance of mortality among Caucasians due to suicide than for African Americans. Why is that? Is that um, a disparity of some kind? Um, or is it uh, an accurate difference that is, cannot be accounted for by uh, social conditions, um, access, or whatever, whatever it is? Another look at suicide. This is national. So the CDC has an entity within it called the National Violent Death Reporting System. Uh, it, participation is voluntary. So um, 18 states at the, at the time this was published, 18 states voluntarily submitted data. And what they reported on was the cumulative data for 11 years, 2003 through 2014. And what did it show? Okay, two things here I'm going to highlight. The suicide rate among Native Americans and Alaska Natives had been increasing over that entire period of time. And second, that rate was three and a half times, or 350 times, 350% higher than that of the racial and ethnic group at the lowest end of that. So what is that? Is that a difference or is there a disparity here, health disparity? Why Native Americans? Why Alaska Natives? Think for a moment about the effects of this 
difference. Okay, when when a, when someone is lost to suicide, there's there's a family grief and disruption. The community loses somebody. Suicide models hopelessness, and for that reason, can lead to disinhibition of restraint from self harm. That tend to be suicides can happen in clusters because of that didn't. Uh, the disinhibition and also um, uh, diminution of community resources because the loss of the gifts, skills, abilities of the individual who has committed suicide. Here's a second example. This is the diagnosis of schizophrenia. So a meta-analysis is an analysis of a collection of studies that have been selected based on criteria for quality. So in a meta-analysis of 52 studies over a long period of time, 83 to more than 34 years, um, the combination of these studies found that African Americans or blacks were 240 percent more likely to be diagnosed with schizophrenia than non blacks. Why is that? Is that a disparity? What would be the causes of that? Is that genetic? Is it due to diagnosis patterns? Is it due to stress? What are the reasons for that? What happens when someone is disproportionately diagnosed with schizophrenia? Schizophrenic drugs, drugs that are used for schizophrenia symptoms are not benign. The newer ones are, are less troublesome than older ones, but they're not benign. So uh, there's heightened exposure to medications with potentially serious side effects. When someone is diagnosed with schizophrenia, that often means they're not diagnosed with something else that may potentially account for their symptoms which means they're not likely to get access to the treatment for that something else, whatever that something else is. There's increased risk for involuntary hospitalization, which at its core is um, removal of civil liberties, being restrained against one's will. It's done for the protection of the patient or, the, or someone else. That's the intent of it, but it's, still, it's not without cost to the person who is hospitalized. And also, when you tell someone they're schizophrenic or you tell their family member, uh, it can lead to hopelessness. Schizophrenia is not a curable illness. It's not like telling someone they have a broken bone and we know how to fix it, or you have appendicitis and we can take it out and you'll be all good. Or you have strep throat and you have this antibiotic that will cure it in 10 days. It's not like that. Once you have it, you have it. and and it has lifelong effects, and it's highly stigmatized. Here's the third example. Paranoid personality disorder. So there's a section of the DSM-5 uh, that includes what we call personality disorders. These are chronic conditions that affect basically all domains of a person's life, but especially their relationships and the way they operate in the world. And, by definition, these disorders first show themselves during adolescence, and they're pervasive across settings. So in this particular case, paranoid personality disorder is characterized by pervasive distrust and suspiciousness of others. A study was done in, in St. Louis, Missouri area. Quite a, quite a large sample, 756 adults. Um, uh, late middle age, I guess you'd say, 55 to 64. And they use statistical procedures to examine the relationship between the symptoms of paranoid personality disorder and other factors, such as their history, demographic factors, and the like. So here's what they found. Compared to whites, African Americans or blacks reported Number one, significantly more paranoid personality disorder symptoms and lower education, parental education, household income, and 
a greater number of childhood traumatic events. So again, he asked the question, think about this. Um, would there be reason to think that someone who had a greater number of traumatic events, lower income, lower education, um, any reason to think that that might lead to higher level of suspiciousness as someone operates in the world? Is it a disparity or is it a difference? A diagnosis of paranoid personality disorder uh, is, again, it's, it's not a benign thing. These are chronic conditions. They don't have cures or, or really very effective treatments. It's stigmatizing to be diagnosed with a personality disorder. And someone who is paranoid is really, it's, it's almost by definition, very difficult to develop a level of rapport or trust in a therapeutic alliance. Creative therapy reliance. We know that just under half, maybe 40% or so, of the variation in treatment outcome, therapeutic treatment outcome, psychotherapy treatment outcome, is not accounted for by the techniques that we use. It's accounted for by what we call non specific factors or the relationship or therapeutic alliance. So, um, Lacking a strong therapeutic alliance is a strong predictor of ineffective treatment outcome. People with paranoid personality disorder are not the most pleasant people or easy people to work with. It's not easy to spend time, a lot of time, with someone who is suspicious of you. And that can lead to clinicians extending fewer uh, efforts. And as I've mentioned before, with schizophrenia, even though it's not a schizophrenic diagnosis, uh, it can lead to uh, trials with antipsychotic medications, which have potential side effects. So I'm, uh, now my fourth example is looking at depression among pre-retirement adults. So these are cases per 1,000, and, and these I'll, I'll walk through these quickly, but they're cumulative. So we start off with uh, with just unadjusted results, and you can see that um, whites have the lowest level of d depression here. These are significant differences. Hispanics the most with the blacks in between. So now you correct that or you account for demographic factors. Look what happens to the rate of depression in African Americans. Now it's less once you've accounted for demographic factors. Now it's less than the Caucasian. The, Hispanic, the rate of Hispanics has decreased as well, although not as much. Now, continuing to account for demographic, now account for health needs. These are medical health needs. Um, there's virtually no change for the Caucasians. Another pretty significant decrease, both for the Hispanics and the African Americans. And then finally now, account for not only demographic and health needs, but also economic access. And look what you have here now. The cases of depression in pre-retirement adults, African Americans have the lowest by a significant amount. And Caucasians and Hispanics have about the same. Now comp compare the, those last three bars to the first the unadjusted rates. And you see how you can reach erroneous conclusions by looking at unadjusted data that don't take into consideration other factors. So with that, let me conclude. There are cultural differences. Um, and that those differences affect the experience of mental health symptoms, the expression of them, and the understanding of mental health conditions. There are also differences in the pattern of diagnosis and treatment of mental health conditions that cannot be explained by the symptoms alone. And thirdly, disparate treatment has negative consequences for the individual, for the community, and for the society as a whole. So it's incumbent upon us, those of us who diagnose and treat mental health conditions, to recognize 
these factors, the cultural, racial, social, socioeconomic context of the conditions that we encounter, that we assess, and that we treat. And uh, here are some references with them. I will conclude. And uh, thank you for your attention. And the second module here will be, we'll turn it over to Dr. David Yellowman.